last time I started talking technically about how we compare sequences, how we define uh, two sequences to be similar. Um, but I wanted to step back just a little bit because uh, there's something nice in the paper today. Uh, this is the New York Times, but it's actually uh, based on a <coughs> science article that just came out. Uh, a group just announced that they've sequenced, um, at least have a rough sequence of the rice genome. And there were some nice quotes in this article in the New York Times that really exactly illustrate the kind of things that I was talking about uh, in the last lecture. Uh, so let me just read some of these to you. Plant geneticists have discovered that the genomes of many major cereal crops are similar to that of rice and have their genes arranged in much the same order. And actually, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Although the rice genome is more compact and was easier to decode. Rice is the Rosetta Stone of the cereals. Once researchers have found an important gene in rice, they can look for its counterpart in other crop plants and insert the rice gene itself since the genes of all these crops are thought to be largely interchangeable. So that interchangeability, the similarity of, of function, was something we talked about last time and is sort of taken today as one of the uh, you know, simplifying statements about, uh, about molecular biology, but really was not known 25 years ago and is one of the surprises. Um, the decoding of the rice genome is expected to unlock the treasure trove of genetic information in world seed banks because with markers for any gene of interest, breeders can now quickly search for a better version of any rice gene or for the counterpart gene in other crops. So again, it's, it's um, that same idea. And um, let me show you what this looks like, this uh, crop circle. If we can have the, uh, the camera on here, please. This is, uh, this is from a science article in 1997. Actually, I think this article is in our, uh, uh, the list of references, but unfortunately, uh, when you access it that way, they omitted this, this circle. So what this circle illustrates is uh, in, in the inside here, um, I think it's rice is the smallest of all these genomes. And the, uh, there's an ordering of, of important genes that are illustrated there. And each of the concentric circles around it is some other grain. They have uh, foxtail millet, sugar cane, sorghum, maize, uh, et cetera, up to oats. And <clears throat> there's really a nice circular correspondence between the equivalent genes uh, in each of these grains. So if you start in the middle here and you recognize a gene in rice and you just go straight out, you'll pretty much hit the equivalent gene in these other grains. So the linear order, although they've drawn this in a circle, the linear order of these genes in these different uh, organisms, in these different grains, has been preserved. Uh, the, the genomes of these different grains are very, very different. Wheat, I don't know whether they're showing wheat on the outside here or not, uh, but wheat is enormous in comparison to rice, and yet pretty much has the same complement of genes. So I'm going to turn the camera back because, yeah, here it shows that wheat has a genome size of 16 um, billion bases, if, that's, if I'm right about that. Yes, so that's, that's, you know, much bigger than humans, about more than, three, more than five times bigger than humans just in terms of the overall size of the genome, the number of nucleotides, whereas rice is uh, 430 million bases. So if humans are about 3 billion, uh, you can do the arithmetic. Uh, but yet, uh, the rice genome and the wheat genome, in terms of the genes, they're not only do they have pretty much the same uh, complement of genes and, and they're interchangeable, but the linear ordering of them has remained the same. So when you study rice, nice and compact genome, what, you've learned, what you learn about it uh, is very applicable to the other grains, and that's why we catalog and, and um, make it easily accessible, everything that was learned about rice or one particular grain, and then when you have some, something you're trying to learn about another grain, uh, you can look it up. If you have a sequence, a gene sequence from another grain, and you find what's similar in, in rice, where you've studied that intensely, then you know a lot about 
uh, the, uh, the gene that you're trying to understand. Okay, so that's all by way of review, really, about what we were talking about last time, the importance and the utility of sequence comparison in, uh, in genomics, and therefore that sets the stage for what um, bioinformatics is, is principally concerned about. So last time we were trying to, we were beginning a definition of, a formal definition of string similarity What does it really mean if we talk about two sequences or two strings being similar? And how will we uh, compute that? And we started really with a, another definition. I don't think I had time to write it up as a definition, but I gave an example. But now I want to do this uh, alignment of two sequences, S1 and S2. And what we mean by that is that we insert spaces into or in front or at the ends, ends of S1 and S2 so that uh, the resulting length is the same. Lengths are the same. And then, because the lengths are the same, you can talk about the two characters in position one and the two characters in position two. They, in any particular position, there might be a space or it might be one of the original characters. It might be two uh, original characters opposite each other or it might be a character opposite a space. And then uh, that's an alignment, okay? Some alignments are good, some alignments are bad. We'll talk about what it means to be good or bad. What's the quality of an alignment? What's the value of an alignment? But right now, an alignment is just you take the two sequences, you stick in spaces where you like so that the resulting lengths are the same, and that is an alignment of uh, sequence S1 and sequence S2. So let me give you an example of one. Uh, let's... Try this one, QAC space, DBD, and QAW, X space, B space. Okay? So these are two sequences which originally had different lengths. This one had length 6, and this one had length... Uh, five, but when I inserted s spaces or put spaces at the end, the two lengths are the same, and therefore I can talk about this is the first position, second position, and so on. Now, in each position, you can look at it and see whether that's a match or a mismatch or a position that has a space. So this is a match because the two characters that are opposite each other are the same, this is also a match. This is a mismatch because the two characters are different. And this one is a space. Now generally, or character opposite a space, generally it, in the, the alignment of two sequences, we don't uh, permit or encourage uh, one space to be opposite another space. So if you have an alignment that's like that, you can just get rid of those uh, two spaces. When we talk later about multiple alignment, aligning more than two sequences at a time, we can have situations, in fact, it's quite common and valuable to have situations where we'll, where we'll have a uh, space opposite another space, but there won't be spaces in that position in all of the sequences. There will be at least one sequence that has a, a real character in that position. So for every position... There's at least one real character. They're not all spaces. All right, so now we can talk about the value of this alignment. This is a particular alignment, and its value, uh, or whether it's a good alignment or bad alignment. Now, before I tell you one way we're going to formalize whether an alignment is good or bad, you should try to remember what is the objective here. Okay. 
Going back to the corpus of biological data, uh, that is, people have learned things about the rice genome, the wheat genome, and so on, out of that came this general observation that we talked about last time that similar uh, sequences, similar molecular sequences, tend to have similar function or structure or history. And therefore, you want a way of formalizing uh, the notion of similarity. So where, where are we in this chain of reasoning? The chain of reasoning uh, had the biological data, the biological simplification or the rule that similar sequences give similar structure. Then we had sort of the math, we're at the mathematical stage now of saying let's try to define what we mean by similarity in a very precise mathematical way. But we want that definition to reflect the biology. The definition has to be meaningful. It has to try to, to um, be such that when we actually compute alignments that demonstrate the similarity of the two sequences, it reflects uh, the underlying biology. So what is the underlying biology that creates differences in sequences? And here we have things that are identical. That's probably a good thing to try to line them up. If they're, if they're identical uh, and you can line up a lot of them, that's a way of saying these two sequences are pretty similar. They haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, but what causes a mismatch? Why do we even permit alignment to have a mismatch? What does it mean biologically? Mutation. Is it what? Mutation. That's a, yeah, that's a mutation. Okay, if we think procedurally or historically, mutation. And in, in uh, particular, this is what's called a point mutation because it's happening at a single nucleotide. Okay, so... That is something that's common in the evolution of, of molecular sequences, that whether it's DNA or protein, uh, you'll have single residues, single positions, which will mutate, which will change over time from one uh, residue to another. Okay? So it's, it's uh, acceptable to have that as a concept, a mismatch, and to allow that in, a, in an alignment. What's a space? Yeah, another thing that happens over time molecularly is either the insertion, you take some sequence that existed at one point in time, and then uh, it can happen that there is an actual insertion of new material, let's say DNA, that's the easiest to think about, uh, new DNA into that sequence, which uh, that particular sequence becomes common and you later sample it. So you have these two sequences, the ancestral and the uh, the current, or you have two that are current that derive from a single ancestor. But the point is that the, the difference between what you have today and what was ancestral could have occurred by the insertion of materials. There are lots of molecular mechanisms that cause that. Anybody want to throw out at least 17? You know, just, just list a few. I'll try one first. What is the question again? What causes insertion of, of new DNA? Um, like trans, um, transformation. Transformation. Okay, that's just a word. What does it mean? Uh, that's uh, you, you it's a uh, when that's uh, like, you know, like a bacteria got a shock or something, then it's gonna like infection of virus. Is that what? Infection of virus. Virus. Okay, so viral infections, bacterial. Um, I'm not sure what the word is there, but. Bacterial transfer of, of DNA uh, also occurs. Um, anybody heard of gene conversion? You know, uh, slippage in in, uh, in replication and so on, where additional uh, the replication isn't exact, but uh, there's an additional insertion of material from one copy into another, and so on. I, you really could easily, and certainly there are articles that do this list 17 or 20 different molecular mechanisms that are known uh, to cause insertion of new DNA. And if we talked at the protein level, uh, we, the story would be a little bit different. Of course, it's all happening at the DNA level, but uh, where you end up seeing two proteins, one is ancestral and the other is, is uh, more current, 
and one has a, a region in it uh, that the other doesn't, there are various uh, explanations for that as well. What about the opposite way? What's another way that, that um, spaces get generated? Historically, if you, deletion, right. So you have some sequence. Again, it's hard to see the ancestral sequence, although not always impossible. If you're talking about viruses, uh, they mutate rapidly enough that you can actually see historically uh, a virus and then some of its, of its uh, derivatives. But uh, it's, it's easiest to think about this historically. So you have a sequence. Imagine you have an sequ ancestral sequence. And then there's some deletion of some intervals of that. Now, that also occurs. Um, it, some of those are the opposite. For example, the gene uh, conversion, where s some material is moved from one to the other, then the one uh, that had it is, is perhaps missing it. Uh, there are some other mechanisms that excise DNA. Uh, and in fact, there's a, base, there's a big question, really, of which is more common, insertion or deletion. If you, if you were to look at the, uh, if you did have the ancestral sequence and you have the, the current sequence, and they're different, is it because the, uh, the modern sequence has actually uh, had additional uh, sequence inserted, or did they lose? Okay, so there are a lot of questions um, like that. For example, there's a uh, basic question of whether introns uh, are were early or late. In other words, we we have in eukaryotes. Uh, I'm sure everybody here knows this. In a in a gene. You have regions, or if you don't know this, it's important that you do. Uh, in a eukaryotic gene, typically, you'll have alternating uh, intervals, uh, one called exons, uh, interrupted by introns, or actually interrupted uh, as part of the the uh, the origin of this word intron. And actually, the introns are generally much bigger than the exons. I'm just drawing this uh, uh, out of scale. And you may have seven or eight of them in a typical gene. And then what happens in transcription, all of this gets transcribed, but later the introns get removed. The exons get concatenated, and that becomes the transcript that's used uh, to produce the protein that this gene codes for. So there is a question, historical question, of uh, and so eukaryotes have this. Prokaryotes do not have the introns typically. So there's a question of did what you know? What's the history of this uh, of this change? Was it that introns um, became inserted, or the, the the genome of eukaryotes came to have introns um, that prokaryotes don't, or was it that prokaryotes had them and they lost them somehow? And of course, that's unresolvable in a way. People argue about it one way or the other. But um, my point is just to say that there is insertion and there's deletion and uh, in the transformation of molecular sequences, many mechanisms uh, for that and plenty of controversy about some of them. So when we talk about two sequences being similar, it's the matches that's, that tend to uh, suggest similarity. Mismatches uh, argue against similarity. But the ability to put in spaces here, the ability to put in spaces here allows you to, to fiddle with these sequences so that you can get matches and avoid mismatches. And the reason that that's permitted, the reason that makes sense in any definition of, of uh, similarity here is because uh, in nature, there really is insertion and deletion. We'll want, ultimately, to have our definitions model the biological processes properly so that, for example, if, yes, there is insertion and deletion, but we shouldn't allow just enormous amounts of it just so that we can get some matches and, and avoid some mismatches. Uh, or maybe it's biologically right to allow as many as we want. Uh, and then... Uh, in order to get many matches. But ultimately, the definition of similarity has to model the basic biological reality that you're trying to model, that you're trying to capture in your model. So the simplest model right now 
is that the value of this alignment is just going to be the number of matches minus number of mismatches minus the number of spaces. Now we're going to embellish this. This is called an objective function or a value function. We're going to embellish this to try to better match the biology throughout the quarter. But right now, we'll just start with this very simple uh, value or measure of the goodness of this alignment. So in this example, we have one match, two, three matches. We have uh, two mismatches. And we have three spaces. So it's negative two. <coughs> so the value of this particular alignment is minus two. Okay. Now, did I do that right? Or um, okay, one, two, three matches. One. Oh, only one mismatch. Thank you. Okay, so you have to, we'll have to think about, and I want you to already begin thinking about, is this a good reflection of the biology to talk about the value of this alignment just in this simplistic way? Number of matches minus number of mismatches minus number of spaces. At least I, I think the signs go the right way, that this is a positive thing. If you have lots of matches, if you can fiddle if you can insert and move around the spaces so that you get lots of matches, that somehow emphasizes that these things are, are similar, I mean, just in the colloquial sense. Mismatches certainly work the opposite way. And it's these spaces, really, which are the kind of thing that may not be intuitive to you yet, uh, because with lots of spaces in there, you can make a lot of matches and avoid a lot of mismatches. So is this really the right way of handling spaces just to subtract off them? Have you captured properly the biology? It's probably an empirical question and probably differs a great deal by the particular application. Um, whether the way you've lined things up here, according to this uh, value, properly reflected the way you think two sequences uh, really relate to each other. Because working backwards, when I have an alignment here, you'd say, oh, this was a mutation, this was a either an insertion or a deletion. I don't know what it is. And that, by the way, explains the typical term for a space that you'll see in, in the biology literature or bioinformatics literature. An indel is just another word will mean for space. And this means either an insertion or deletion. I don't know which it was. When you look at it in an alignment, it's a space. But historically, it was either an insertion or deletion. Uh, all right, so that's the value at the moment we're going to take for a particular alignment. With that, we can define what it means, what we mean by string similarity, or the first definition of string similarity that will, the simplest one, which is this it's the maximum possible value. Since similarity of, of sequences S1 and S2, the maximum possible value of any alignment of S1 and S2. So this was one particular alignment of these two sequences. There are many others. In fact, we'll count a little bit later. We'll look at how many different alignments there are. But this is just one particular one, uh, and it had a particular value, minus 1. But if we say that a large value here tends to suggest that these are similar, and a, and a small value tends to suggest that they're not very similar, then this definition makes intuitive sense. 
that if we want to define precisely what the similarity is of two sequences, it's obtained from the alignment that gives us the largest possible value. Okay? And so this is, this is uh, what I would say is the mathematical model of similarity. Just again, <coughs> emphasizing where we are in this chain of reasoning. Just an abstract definition, really. And again, you have to uh, ask yourself whether this mathematical model properly captures the biology that you're interested in. If you have several sequences and you, you look at each pair of them under this definition, assuming we know how to compute this, but that's, we'll get to that in a moment, and you look at the numbers that come out, uh, will it be such that when you look at those sequences, you say, yes, uh, these two that have the large number I think really are highly similar, so this was a good definition. And the two that, uh, ha that have a low number really are not very biologically related or evolutionarily related. You want this definition to have that property. That uh, I mean, this is just very, very common what people will do if you have hundreds of sequences and you have a program that can compute this, you'll compute this for each pair, and then you'll say the ones with the large number are pretty evolutionary related or related by in some uh, important biological way, and the ones with a small number uh, are not. And then you'll group together the ones that all have a, a large number together and say that's some kind of common family, and uh, that's, that's, that exercise is called clustering. So this is at the heart of, such a definition is at the heart of uh, a huge amount of things that we do in bioinformatics. Database lookups are based on such definitions. Uh, the, raw, the numerical data that's used in building phylogenetic trees is based on such definitions. Uh, the clustering that I just mentioned is based on such definitions. So this kind of simplistic model, although we will embellish it, we'll make it more relevant, is at the heart probably of uh, the majority of what's done in sequence-oriented bioinformatics. And finding a similar kind of, an analogous kind of definition for things like three-dimensional structure or regulatory networks and so on is what people try to do. So the, they try to follow this paradigm for things other than sequences. So we have to understand this and we have to also come to see whether we believe it made sense. All right, so this is the mathematical model of similarity. The next stage in that chain of reasoning the algorithmic problem. How do we compute efficiently Uh, the similarity of two sequences. So the mathematical model gives you the what. This is what we want to compute. The algorithmic problem is the how. How do you actually do that? So what I like to do whenever I, I'm faced initially with a how question or an algorithmic question is first of all think fairly naively, brute force. How would you just do it if um, there were no constraints of efficiency? All you're trying to do is come up with some simple method. The way I like to, to think about that is somebody comes in that door with, in one hand, a million dollars, and the other hand, a gun, and they say, you have five minutes to think of a method to solve this and get it programmed. If you do it, you get the million dollars. If you don't do it, I shoot you. So you don't have time to be clever. Cleverness takes time to think through things through. You just have to do something that uh, you can, your fingers can move really quickly and write the program. They didn't say you actually had to get the, the program had to finish in five minutes. It's just that you had to finish writing the program uh, for that problem. 
So, you know, what, what, what is the most straightforward way of trying to compute the similarity of two sequences? We have a definition of similarity. The definition of similarity is the maximum possible value. We have a definition of value. Okay? Given an alignment, we can compute the value. The similarity is the maximum value over all possible alignments. So the brute force thing to do is to try to generate all the alignments. Just write some program that will generate all the alignments, <coughs> compute the value of each one as you've generated it, keep track of what the best one is, and when it's finished, you'll have the value, and you'll also, if you've kept the appropriate uh, information, you'll have what that particular alignment is as well. Okay? Now, what does it take to generate all possible alignments? I mean, all possible, an alignment is defined by where you put the spaces in. Okay? So you really only have to choose uh, at every particular position uh, whether you're going to put a space in there and how many. Okay? Um, you certainly are not going to put in, we said that you're not going to have two spaces opposite each other, so the num total number of spaces you put in is only going to be at, at most as many characters as there are in the other sequence. Okay, so I'm just outlining how you would uh, start writing a program to do this. It would probably have several nested loops, one which would uh, have a loop talking about how many total spaces you're going to put in there, another loop that's going to talk about where you'd put these spaces in, another loop that will then go through the two sequences as they're aligned and compute the value and so on. Probably those of you who've taken the prerequisite courses for this one and actually have some programming experience, you could probably write a three-loop program that would do this when any, different, any uh, sequence comes in. And it may actually be worthwhile later uh, probably not now, but when you know enough Perl to uh, try to write that program, give yourself five minutes uh, to write it, and then, you know, after three or four hours, it'll be done. Uh, but I sometimes do that. I mean, I just I say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to take five minutes on this program max, and then, again, about four hours, it's, it's sort of done. All right, but that's, that's one approach, and I'm not showing you in detail because it's not the approach we're going to emphasize. Um, because, we'll see in a minute, there are a lot of different alignments. There are so many different alignments that that approach will not work. People like to think naively that computers are very fast. Uh, they like to think computers are big or computers are smart. But those three assumptions, uh, if you're in computer science, we start from just the opposite. And all of the problems in computer science are based on the fact that computers are really teeny. They don't remember very much at all. They're very slow, and they're very stupid. They only do very simple mechanical things. And uh, you know, almost all of computer science is based on trying to get around those three basic uh, realities, uh, even though a lot of people think just the opposite. And of course, compared to some of the things, computers are big, fast, and smart. But compared to what we want them to do, uh, it, it's appropriate to think exactly the opposite. And in this problem in particular, straight brute force enumeration of all the alignments would be absolutely out of the question. I don't know how many ages of the universe it would take for two sequences. Well, we'll figure this out in a minute. For two sequences of uh, lengths that we're interested in, thousands or hundreds of thousands, people are now aligning billions, uh, aligning whole genomes. But doing it straightforward like that is out of the question. So, in fact... Uh, let me digress here and start talking about how many alignments there are, just for a couple of reasons. One, to drive home this point that straight uh, enumeration is not going to work. I want to make that point really clear because we're going to spend a lot of time on another method that's much more efficient. And, and you, know, you ought to ask, why are we doing that? Why are we going to spend so much time on something else when there's clearly a very simple way of doing it? And the answer is the simple way just doesn't work uh, in practice. And the other way of doing things, which is an example of what's called dynamic programming, is a method that permeates bioinformatics. So we want to see how it works on this particular example, and then we'll see uh, how it 
it differs in different examples. But the reason for, get, for going to something clever that's going to take us a couple of lectures or more to fully develop is because the straightforward approach is not practical. And I want, so I want to show you that. The other reason for counting in particular here, there actually there's several reasons, is it's going to remind you a little bit about uh, permutations and combinations, which is something that you will we'll need throughout the quarter. Uh, and the third reason is that um, I have a couple of Perl programs that I'll put on the web that, can, that do the counting. And that will be a, a way in which you'll start seeing some uh, Perl program in action. So uh, how many alignments are there of two sequences? Let's make them both the same length to begin with. That'll simplify things. And later, if, if uh, uh, it, it might be appropriate for me to ha ask you as a homework type question to modify this formula uh, for two sequences that are not the same length. But two sequences of length, let's just abstractly call it n each. OK? Anybody have an answer? Well, it's, that's OK. That's to be expected. Um, all right. Well, the way we're going to do this analysis, here's our question. <coughs> we're actually going to focus on uh, how many spaces are inserted. So uh, we're going to abstractly say, uh, let's say the number of spaces inserted is R. Just, uh, I have a particular symbol for it. We'll figure out how many alignments there are when there are spaces, and then we'll just sum over uh, the possible values of R, and that will be our formula. Okay? So here's a subproblem. If we insert R spaces exactly. into each sequence, how many alignments are there? OK. Oh, by the way, Sasha is in the lab today after class. So those of you who uh, want help today in the lab, uh, this would be a good time to go over there. <clears throat> so in order to answer this question, let's just imagine that I'm going to put down placeholders for sequence S1 after I've put in spaces somewhere. So how many placeholders are there? Oh, OK, there are 10 in this, I guess, in this little example. This is, this is uh, designed to you know, get your intuition moving. Uh, usually, when you do mathematics, this is sort of the picture that you use to get your intuition going. But uh, <laughs> so this is abstract. How many spaces are there in terms of our notation? We have n original characters. We have r spaces. So n, n plus r, OK, places. OK? So now, um, if you focus on putting the spaces into S1, OK, now that we have actually the placeholders, what that really means is uh, putting in the n characters from S1 into these placeholders. We have n plus r placeholders now. And if I look at where the spaces went into S1, uh, it really means, well, OK, I'll put the first character there, and I'll put the second character there, and the third character there, and the fourth character there, and so on, of S1. And then that gives you uh, what spaces you've put in, what and where 
you put spaces into S1, which is one half of the description of an alignment. Okay? So we're thinking about, we're trying to count how many alignments are there. And the way we're thinking about it is by saying, I'm going to generate an alignment by looking at n plus r places and now uh, putting into those places the n characters of S1. And how many ways can I do that? So step one, put the n characters of S1 into the n plus r um, placeholders. Okay. In how many ways? So this is where the permutations, combinations, stuff that you learn in high school and in your statistics course comes in. C n plus r combination. It's what? C n plus r and n. Yeah, okay. So it is, um, uh, there are different ways of writing this. n plus r, choose n. Okay? That's one notation. You have n plus r places, and you're going to choose n of them to put in the characters from S1. And this is the number of ways that you can do that. It's sometimes also written this way. Okay, C, N plus R, comma, N. It's written this way in older textbooks where they didn't have nice typesetting. This was difficult to write out in the book, so uh, this is the, uh, another way which is often written. And what's the formula for that? What is this? N plus R choose N. I know there's some students here in statistics. I mean, uh, I mean, grad students in statistics. This has got to be second nature to you, and some math students too. So, it's um, it, N plus R ex explanation mark over N. N plus R minus N plus R minus N. You were getting there, but you, you would have simplified it. You, you were going to make it you know, N plus R minus N factorial, but that's the same as R. It's R. So, and what's factorial, by the way? So K factorial is the 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to K. It's the product of those. Okay? So this is a big number. N plus R factorial is a big number. Of course, you're dividing by the product of things that look pretty big, too. But this is a very rapidly growing function. In fact, if you, uh, just to, to see how bad this might be, just make R uh, about half N. Or about N, sorry. So then you have 2N choose N. <coughs> and if we had time... Um, this should be something like n to the n. Okay, that's not quite right, but uh, this is very rapidly growing. Okay, probably even faster than that. But it's it's uh, well maybe n over two. Yeah. But anyway, very rapidly growing function. Okay. Now of course we're dividing. Uh, sorry, that's that's what this is. Yeah. All right, so that's one part of this analysis. We're putting in characters from S1. Now in step two, we're going to put in the characters from S2 in here in order to get an alignment. So how many different ways are there to do that? Is what? Okay, the first thought is it's the same thing. Okay? But it isn't really. Right, because we're not permitted to put a space opposite a space. Okay, so you might think, oh yes, S2, we're just going to put its characters in there somewhere, and, uh, and then we'll, the, the total number, therefore, would be the product of these two things, or this thing squared. But we said we're not going to permit 
a space opposite a space. Okay. So now how do we think about this? So you want to, in our step two, um, in this many ways, okay. So step two, put in characters of S2, but avoid um, a resulting space opposite a space. Okay, you don't want to, you want to put these in such a way that you don't have one space opposite another one. So if this is where I put in characters, I have to be sure not to put any spaces here. This has to be a real character. Okay? So can anybody see the logic of how you think about that? Well, you sort of think the opposite. You stand on your head. Uh, in S, in, when we were thinking about S1, we were thinking about where we're going to put the characters of S1 into here. We could have equivalently thought about where we're going to put the spaces. Okay? And now, when we're down here, we want to make sure that we don't put spaces opposite a space. So uh, one way to think about this is where will I put the spaces that are in S2? They all have to, if they're not going to be opposite a space, they have to be opposite a real character. Okay, so if I take the n spaces in here, the, sorry, the n positions in here that were used for real characters, and I now choose where I'm going to put spaces, where I'm going to put the r spaces down here, then that will tell me where the spaces for this one are, and then the opposite, the, the ones that were not chosen as spaces are chosen for, for characters, and then. Um, uh, I'll put those in. So let me remind you, this is n plus r, choose n ways. And what I just outlined is that n, you have n real characters there, and we have to decide where we're going to put the spaces. There are spaces ways. Okay. Now, so, so hopefully you get that, that logic, because it's a kind of a cute idea, a cute thought, that in order to avoid putting a space opposite a space, if I already know where the characters of S1 are, I just have to think about where I'm going to put the spaces from S2 and only choose places where there's a real character already from S1. And I can do it in that many ways. And having chosen where the spaces are, I, of course, then just go along with the characters of S2 and stick them in those positions that are remaining. Okay? So the total equals n plus r choose n times n choose r. Okay? That's for r spaces. Now, the first question you might ask, by the way, is what happens if r is bigger than n? I mean, n is not bigger than n plus r, so this is well defined. But what does it mean to choose more spaces than there are positions? Well, you can't do that without creating a space opposite a space. So in fact, r is always less than or equal to n. So we're only interested in, in r less than or equal to n, so this makes sense. So now the total number of alignments, that was the total if you used r. So total number of alignments equals the summation of r 0 to n, n plus r choose n times n choose r. So we'll try to do some analysis on this to convince you that this grows very, very rapidly. And uh, I'll put on the web a program that computes this, actually two programs, one that computes this in a very poor way and runs out of memory 
uh, quickly or is unable to, to get to large n, and another one that does it a little more efficiently and gets to very large n. You can just see that these numbers grow very, very rapidly so that there's no possibility of, of working with a program that generates all the alignments. We're going to have to have a, a more clever way of doing things. And that's why the need for that and the fact that we can do that is why this course is in computer science. Well, at least that's what I focus on. Yes, one question before we have to go. Um, is it for each way that is the order of the uh, relative characters now? You have n to say you have n plus r. Yeah. n to ways. For each way, it doesn't matter what position each one is relative to the other. Like you're putting in like four or five characters, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the characters have to, okay, so the question is, does it matter what order the characters are? The characters, the order of the characters are the same as they were in S1 and S2. We, to make an alignment, we just are permitted to put in spaces. We're not permitted to move around characters. Later, we may be in a richer model, but right now, our model of alignment and of molecular evolution does not permit that.